And yes, last weekend was the huge weekend for USC recruiting. However, great recruiters never stop. Three more in tow for USC football for 2025. We will discuss right here at Trojan Conquest Live right here at the Voice of College Football. Appreciate these two always being here for us. Tim Prangley, of course, Trojan's Wire. Matt Zemek taking a brief hiatus from March Madness to join us, uh, of course, on our USC show that we provide for you each and every Monday night. But with the basketball game uh, last night, uh, we have rescheduled for Tuesday night. So pull up a chair, join us for the next 60 Talking USC Football. Guys, how are we doing tonight? All right. And uh, hey, Mark, Mark Rogers, more agility than Reggie Bush in the open field, adjusting to Tuesday to accommodate the women's basketball team in the Elite Eight. That's why Mark Rogers is Mark Rogers, the voice of college football. Well, thank you so much, Matt. But with everything that you have going on, I, I think that that title needs to be bestowed your way. So, Matt, thank you so much for accommodating us this week. We appreciate you. I was assuming you were taking the week off, but we will take you every time we can get you. So thank you so much for being here because we know you've got so much going on this time of year. Tim, of course, here as well. And here we go with three big commits, as, of course, we will take your comments and questions there in the chat. We appreciate the Super Chat contributions as well. A running back would be the first one to look at here. One Riley Wormley out of South Lake, Texas at 59170, 39th rated player at his position in the country, top 70 player in the state of Texas, Tim. Yeah, well, he had a pre existing um, relationship going back with Anthony Jones back to his time at, at, at Texas. Here's the thing we got to say, guys. I mean, don't get me wrong, you know, some of the best running backs of all time. For USC, just statistically in the top 15, uh, there's like at least five guys from Texas. Um, but this running back room now is just getting insanely deep with just Texas backs. Like literally, I'm beginning to wonder if all we do is um, recruit Texas backs. But it, it, he's a little bit different. He seems like a guy, you know, that's, that's going to come in. Uh, he's got this um, kind of a smaller back, you know. Uh, it, lately, they've been getting the bigger backs. And if they are getting it back, that's not quite six foot one, six foot. It's a guy that's usually pretty stout. Uh, and and uh, Matt, I mean, we did talk about Riley Wormley. Do you have any thoughts on him? Uh, you know, my main thought is not so much about Wormley specifically, like, you know, and, you know, in, in general, not just for Wormley, but for any recruit, like I don't do the deep dives into their high school histories. You know, I, I have uh, too, too many things going on uh, at Trojans Wire and, and, and elsewhere. But like I, I try to see the big picture, and the, to me, the big picture is like if you're looking for validation, if you're looking for signs of you know confirmation of Lincoln Riley's shift in philosophy, more defense, more running the ball, more physicality, you know, getting bigger, thicker uh, on the lines, you know, bringing in another running back, just that's that's the validation that it's going to be a, a little bit less of a of a Ferrari and more of a, of a Ford pickup truck in terms of, you know, adjusting to the big 10, being able to win, you know, those uh, slobber knocker 20 to 13 games in the cold and the wind and the rain, uh, you know, it, like being able to play a, one of those 11 AM uh, brunch football games at Kinnick uh, or, or Purdue, uh, you know, on a foggy, soggy, morning when like no one wants to be up at that hour from the west coast and but we're gonna ram the ball between the tackles and you know to do this you need depth like you and usc has not used a lot of bodies at running back either of the last two years you had travis die in 2022 until he got hurt and then it was basically austin jones uh, carrying the load when, when Dye got hurt. And then last year it was Marshawn Lloyd. And you did not see a lot of guys getting a lot of touches. It was not equally spread around. It was pretty much a 1A and then maybe a 1B as an occasional change of pace. But it was basically a lead running back getting the vast majority of carries. That has to change in the Big Ten. You know, In order to be able to run the ball consistently, you need to be giving different guys – 
uh, lots of carries. You need to be spreading the wealth around so that guys are fresh, so that no one guy is taking too many hits. That's the significance of the Riley Wormley recruitment for me. And, and really on, on a broader level, any running back added to the fold, it's, it's bolstering that notion of, you know, it takes a village now in the running back room. We're getting away from the, the, the one meal ticket and we're going to a, a, a more community model. It's kind of like the defensive side of the ball. You know, you're going to have multiple, you're going to have co-coordinators and you're going to have, you know, Matt Entz and Doug Belk and Taylor Mays all, you know, collaborating on the game plan. Lincoln Riley is embracing uh, a more communal style of living. And part of this is the running back room, giving lots of touches to lots of guys so that guys are staying fresh. Uh, no, no one person is taking too many bullets. You know, you're going to, you're going to be distributing the workloads that you have three, four guys who are consistently able-bodied through the entirety of a big 10 season. That that's really the big picture here at USC with the running back room. Matai Tagawai is the highest rated of the three committed over the weekend from San Clemente, California, listed as a safety at, safety at 6'4", 190, 71st uh, rated player nationally. So big commit there, top 10 rated player at his position, number three rated player, Tim, in the state of California. Yeah, a big guy, kind of like you want to think he's almost like a um... – He's kind of like that Eric Gentry. Eric Gentry is obviously a little bit taller than him, but this year talk about a big, tall, rangy linebacker. Not the biggest guy, so probably uh, will be playing linebacker though. But that's what's so interesting about him. The guy is so athletic and freakish. I mean, he he can drop back. So if you had him at that will position, right, he'd be able to drop back into coverage uh, prototypically. Or in Sam, when they pulled that nickel off and they had the Sam linebacker in Dantlin system, he's that kind of guy that's going to be able to get you out on the edge, but also again drop back and 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 cover um i like you know, the fact that they just keep going after athletes right danton lynn said in the very beginning he wants versatile players this is this is this is what you talk about when you say versatile i mean i he's his size I mean, who knows maybe one day he could put on enough size to move to like a, a, a an end position i don't i don't know i'm not not in this defense but it does look like he's going to be something on the outside as a linebacker um I would like to believe that he can be that kind of guy that just causes the quarterbacks to have to change the trajectory of their throws, stepping back into passing lanes, uh, and, and just really quick. This guy is fast and big, so just another huge pickup. They just keep lining up these top 100 players nationally on the defensive side of the ball. Once again, what Matt opened up with, Lincoln Riley said, everything we're going to do here is to get this defense in line. I think people talk too much crap about Riley's defense and now he really took that to heart and everything he's doing. And we look at also, remember, we had the big news about how they're opening up NIL. We talked about that last week on both shows. NIL's opened up now. So I'm not sure exactly what that plays into as far as a lot of these commitments. But now you have the situation where USC has its NIL collective program going at full speed. Um, and I don't see any of these defensive studs slowing down anytime soon. My... Uh a uh, point to add, uh, you know, is with, with, with Tagawai is it's a California recruit. And, and if, if you look at the big board here, the, the, the four names that you see, you see two California products, you see a Florida product, you see a Texas product. Of course, you know, USC went into Georgia for uh, Justice Terry and, and, uh, and other uh, commitments as well. So you're seeing USC doing really, really well. Uh, you know, in SEC country and in California. So that's a really nice balance. I mean, also Texas. I guess we need to call Texas SEC country yeah. now. I feel yep. so wrong. Uh, but, but you know, so there's a nice balance of, you know, keeping Cal California products at home and also going into SEC locales. And that's really good. But now here's kind of the word of caution or, or perhaps just me kind of, you know, defaulting into my bad cop tendencies. We need to get some offensive linemen. You know, like that, that's the position group we're not seeing enough of. Need, need to beef up there. And we need to go into these Big Ten uh, states and get some get some dudes uh, up front. You know, the, like that seems to be the missing piece of the puzzle with this 2025 recruiting class. Really good in Cali, really good in, in uh, Georgia and Florida, some, some wins in Texas as well. So in Sunbelt states, 
But uh, I'd like to see some Midwest recruiting wins, and I'd like to see some offensive lineman recruiting wins. That, that's that's what needs to come into the picture here for this 2025 class, which, as Tim Prangley wrote at Trojans Wire uh, earlier today, ranked number three in the on three uh, rankings, number nine in 247, because they both, you know, they they do the numbers uh, and have a different formula. But uh, number three and on three and really high in terms of per player uh, rating. So lots of good stuff. But of course, there are some specific areas where you're seeing, well, there's still uh, some undiscovered frontiers uh, that USC needs to be able to enter into. Yeah, actually, they've they've moved up with the latest commits. They moved up to number seven in the 247 composite Um and, and we want to say that that so just so you guys out there wondering why the big disparity it's not just in the players right there's two ranking systems but also the way they rank the classes uh, on three does it to where you have like they look at the average number of recruits that have committed to the schools and they set to say let's say at four or five or whatever six whatever it is and then they take those top six players in each class so you have a situation I wrote about where you have Notre Dame it's the number one class. But uh, USC's uh, like overall player ranking is like 94 point something or whatever. You got Ohio State at 96, I think. Uh, then you have uh, Notre Dame, not bad, but they're like nine, they have 17. They have 17 commitments. SC has seven, and so they have 17 commitments, and uh, their average uh, player ranking is like 90 point something. So we go into all the numbers, you guys. The point, I mean, really, are we going down to the decimal point stuff? The fact of the matter is, is that uh, one takes every pretty much everybody and kind of lumps them together. So you, you have 17 guys in your class. He's going kind to of move you up higher. On three, I like it because early on, you know, if you don't have a bunch of three stars and, and lower ranked guys, you can't plug it up for that ranking system. It can actually give you a better snapshot of the quality of the class, I think, at on three when you're looking at the top, uh, top 10. Take Hawaii with 59 tackles in his junior season, eight tackles for loss, seven sacks, seven hurries, also forced uh, three passes batted at the line by Tank Hawaii. So there's the safety that came in there. And then we go to the cornerback, who is Treston Castro, 6'1", 160, Upland, California. He's 34th rated at his position, according to 247 Sports, 31st rated in the state of California, and he committed today. Yeah, this, this guy's your cover corner. This guy will blanket you. Uh, he's got 11 interceptions over the past two years. Um, just, uh, I, I think I saw USC, uh, USCJ, I think he posted something about the fact that he just won a camp, the Under Armour camp. He won the MVP of that camp. Uh, so I'm sure you're going to see his numbers. He's, he's rated as a three-star right now, the 34, uh, best corner and by 247. I'm, I'm just thinking those numbers are going to, uh, improve, uh, with just his play. Um, again, I, I think I was just quoting some information. I, I don't, and I, the, the scout that I was quoting was Greg Biggins, who really knows his stuff over 247, just saying this guy is a lockdown cover corner. So I'm going to go with that evaluation over star rankings and and early on you know you guys just going off his junior year he has a whole senior year and a bunch of camps are sure to go to improve that stock and, and the more anything I, I more than anything i'm gonna you know <laughs> i caught myself doing that more than anything i'm just gonna listen to doug belk if doug belk wants this guy right if, if he wants to go after him then d believe me it's someone that we if he wants to give take an offer uh, offer this guy and take a commitment from a kid like this this early in this in the uh year I'm going to go with Doug Belk and trust his evaluation over pretty much 247 on three rivals, ESPN, whoever you want to look at. That's, that's really what you want to be looking at. Those are 12 career interceptions from Castro, including 14 passes defense. He had 99 tackles as a sophomore playing at cornerback. So I don't know what that says about his defense. It says yeah. a lot about his personal defense, but uh, the team uh, that backed off to 58 total tackles uh, the next season. I stand corrected. That's a career total of 99. He did, though, have 58 tackles at cornerback in his sophomore season and then 36 this past year. Got into the backfield a few times for some sacks and tackles for loss as well. Trojan Conquest yeah, Live. That's still a lot of heavy whiskey. 
Absolutely. Trojan Conquest Live, everyone, right here at the Voice of College Football. We're here on a Tuesday because of the women's game on Monday. We'll be back next Monday at, uh, well, we may want to rethink that one. I believe we've got the Men's National Championship game, correct? Yeah, yeah so that's we'll right. And, that, that one for next and, 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 and we all know the tip time is always 921 Eastern time. That's regular. They regularly put it right then instead of doing it at 830, which would be, you know, the same thing to do. But, you know, I've been beating that drum for a decade without any results. So. So stay tuned. That's the big reason, folks, why you subscribe to the channel. Hit the bell for the notifications. That way, you know, when we go live and we will also be posting uh, a notification to let you know on the community page when we are going to go live and accommodate the men's national championship game. But then after that, it will be back to every Monday night, 10 Eastern, 7 Pacific. All right. I was all geared up for these uh, commitment breakdowns. And after that, I uh, don't have any more of a rundown. Where do we stand uh, elsewhere? Spring ball, Tim. When's well, the last time you were able to get out there? I was not there. There was another 5.30 a.m. Um, 5.30 a.m. practice this morning. Uh, and I was going to go out to, to there to take pictures. But unfortunately, until I get a better lens, you guys, let's put it this way. Um, the night, the, the, the low shots with like, you know, with, I can't set my aperture low enough to zoom in. Cause you remember we're, we don't get to walk where we want. So if you want to see the linemen, they're 50, 60 yards that way. So realistically, um, and the practices are, are, are pretty quick. I wasn't able to get out there this morning, but, uh, there, you know, we did, I will be there on Thursday for, uh, for practice. There's actually two 30, a more reasonable two 30 on Thursday. So I'll, I'll be out there uh, for those practices. One thing that, you know, is really important to note though, about these, uh, really, really early morning practices, like this is no accident, right? This is Lincoln Riley beginning to, you know, not just directly tell his players, but in also indirectly, just like, you need to be disciplined. You need to be able to wake up and be alert and be dialed in. Uh, this is Big Ten preparation. This is this is preparation for those 11 a.m. Central Time games, those 9 a.m. Pacific Time games. And and hey, Mark, like you know the deal. You remember Cal and Kevin Riley sleepwalking uh, to Maryland for a 9 a.m. game. You remember Kevin Hogan and Stanford. Just, you know, <laughs> with a total nothing burger in an 11 a.m. game at Northwestern uh, a decade ago. And, of course, you know, like Kevin Hogan, that was the golden era for Stanford football under David Shaw. Three Rose Bowls in four years. Stanford was running the show in the Pac-12, overtaking Chip Kelly in Oregon, but couldn't solve the body clock game uh, at Northwestern at Ryan Field. You know, it's sleepy time. So this is Lincoln Riley planting some seeds and getting guys into habits. He's thinking several months ahead. So like that, that's part of the storyline. Like this is not just, you know, a coach trying to instill discipline. This is Big Ten preparation. It starts now. Lincoln Riley is already trying to get his guys into that body clock mode, that body clock uh, mindset. So that it is no accident that these he's loading up the early morning practices at USC. Yes, Christian McCaffrey and company were – unstoppable in the Rose Bowl a few months later against a better Iowa team, but taking on Northwestern, six points on the board for that 11 a.m. start uh, absolutely on in week one. Uh, we've got some interesting numbers to pass along ourselves. We've got uh, 220 people watching right now. We've got about 70 or 80 watching us on YouTube. Now, that's fine. We have opened this up to Facebook, Instagram, Twitter as well. Uh, for uh, accommodating all of you, regardless of where you want to join us on social media. But just keep in mind, uh, for the comments and questions, you get to join us here on YouTube. But we are doing our best to make it a, uh, an easy watch or listen for all of you. So we appreciate uh, 220 on the line um, here at the Voice of College Football. That actually be interesting too. Also, I'm not sure if they can stream through that too. I know people on Twitter or X can go ahead 
and uh, leave comments as well. If you are if you are watching on one of the other platforms, I'm curious. Go ahead and drop us a comment. Uh, we will we will feature it. Love to see who's out there on the different platforms. We've been running pretty much on on Facebook. I mean on on um, on YouTube this entire time for what 96 episodes. So uh, it's about time we reached out to see what other communities are out there. So uh, look for us. I'll, we're gonna I'll go to Facebook as well, Mark. See what we can do there as well. Trying to gather as, as many Trojan fans together in one place as possible every Monday, usually on Monday nights. Obviously today because of the of the uh, women of Troy playing last night, and then it appears next Monday because of the of the uh, championship game. We won't be going live, but you will be able to see us all throughout the summer. Um, we got a couple more weeks of practice here, as well as on the 20th, there's going to be the spring game. I will have a lot of video, hopefully, and pictures from that game and news and, and what I see on the sidelines uh, for all of you guys coming up in a couple of weeks. So please make sure you are subscribing. Uh, drop us a follow on Instagram or on Twitter. And then also, uh, if you could go ahead and hit that subscribe button here at the Voice College Football on the YouTube channel. Just go, um, that way you know when we go live because just remember we went Matt and I went live that Saturday when all of a sudden we started pulling in uh, left right and center kids from the SEC flipping Justice Terry from Georgia we went live for phone calls that's one of our shows we do on Friday night we're gonna have a call in show where you can call in we'll have the number is 888-99-RILEY about as easy as you can get you guys can call in and, and basically it's the only one that we know of uh, we were the first we're probably not gonna be the last but we basically turn the show over to you guys and take your calls and uh, listen to what you want to talk about in USC. And you can pick Matt in my brain for about an hour to an hour and a half, as long as I can hold Matt on the show. So. And just to conclude that sentiment um, on Facebook in particular and all over social media, keep this in mind, everyone, that uh, not everyone knows that the voice of college football exists or that Matt's here or that Tim are on Trojans wire. So you are our feet on the ground uh, so we appreciate the grassroots support. Uh, we've joined a lot of USC Facebook groups, but if you are involved in those groups and others on social media, let people know that we are here again, typically on Monday nights, uh, talking USC football. And then again, as Tim was pointing out, Matt and Tim, as part of our uh, Big Ten SEC call-in doubleheader on Friday nights, you get me and Tim talking the Big Ten at 7 Eastern, and then directly following, it's Tim and Matt uh, talking USC with the call-in show. And yes, the subscribe button is right there. And uh, very briefly, we'll we'll just bring this in. Uh, I like Benji is letting me know, hey, love you, Mark. We'll stop right you, there, Benji. Benji. But I you, incorrectly Benji. ranked <laughs> Lincoln Riley. How dare I rank him number 11 in the country in coaches' rankings, especially since Tim and I had a, a just a slight misunderstanding about that a couple of weeks, just a tiny misunderstanding about that uh, a couple of weeks ago, <laughs> and and I, I not that not that I go to the likes of ESPN or CBS Sports or two four seven or or the likes to to back up my opinions because I I'm my own man I stand on my own opinions, but they were generally in that eleven and twelve range themselves. Yeah, where Mark, where Mark and I kind of, there were some things that having like Jonathan Smith, who I think is a wonderful coach, wonderful. I've been I've been talking about him for the past five years at Oregon State. Absolutely amazing. Don't really know what he's done to elevate himself above a Lincoln Riley. That it was overall, you you did an excellent job of backing up all of your candidates, all your all your coaches at the top eleven, including Riley, were all I think really should be you know be in that eleven range. I just took umbrage with the 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 order in which you chose to put I, I guess Riley still hasn't proved it to you uh fair enough last year I mean there's clear enough criticism for him he took it on the chin he basically said you know what this hurts it sucks but I'm gonna fix it and and I've got to say uh you know what we're seeing from Riley right now will have to show you mark on the yes. field but That's I've got I've got a pretty good feeling that you know when he was in Oklahoma yeah, there was a level of consistency. What he couldn't do is he just couldn't. We know this. We know that he's going to have, even last year with that offensive line, he still had one of the top offenses with a very bad offensive line. Being one of the top offenses, imagine when USC starts rolling up top 20, top 15 defenses with, with a Lincoln Riley offense. It's an in-the-moment ranking, and I ranked him number eight 
last offseason, number eight in the country. And he was a two point conversion away from losing his last six in a row. Well, but he's also he was also um, a last second field goal. We could play the 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 game. You you win the game, you have more points. You know, you could look at Utah, right? You can't look at many other games, but you can look at that Utah game, and that was one they probably could have won if they had a, a you know anybody on defense during that last drive. So. USC fans have also released my Big Ten quarterback rankings, so you can see where I have Miller Moss ranked. Oh no, Mark! Come on, we're trying to get subscribers. <laughs> I think I was very favorable on that ranking. Six touchdowns. Remember six touchdowns? I, remember six I do. Touchdowns where, where do you think I had him ranked? In what? In the Big Ten or, or nationally? In the Big Ten. 18 oh, wow. starting quarterbacks. God, yeah, I, I got to be honest with you. This, I'm not really excited about any of the quarterbacks in the Big Ten. So, uh, a Miller Moss. Um, I don't know. We got him like fourth. Fifth? Number five. Fifth is entirely fair. Based, you know, given that he had one, he's had one great game that he hasn't played a full season. That's that's pretty fair, Tim, right? I'll take I'll take, I'll give, take it fifth. Up, give it up to Mark on this one, right? I'll, I'll take fifth. Well, okay, but here's the thing. <laughs> Who does Mark have behind him? I Dylan, mean, look, this, face, this is the big Ted's quarterbacks, not exactly murderers row here. You well, know? Dylan Gabriel and Will Rogers are two of the most prolific, regardless of what they truly are as talents, if you're scouting them for NFL ability. But if you're just looking at raw statistics, they're two of the most prolific quarterbacks in the history of the game. You, you realize if Dylan Gabriel throws as many touchdowns this year as he threw last year, he will be the all time leader in career touchdown passes in college football. And he will be, if he just throws for 2,200 yards, he will be number two all time in passing yardage. So Dylan Gabriel, Will Howard, and um, Will Rogers. And then I had Drew Aller. He threw 25 touchdowns and two picks. I know that he looked terrible against Ohio State and Michigan, but still I'm going to uh, reward and recognize a five-star who played a 13-game schedule and went 10-3 and three, through 25 touchdowns and two picks against those defenses. Fair enough. So, Miller Moss at number five. I can't, I can't complain about that one. And, and, the, and the other thing is, is that, you know, like Miller Moss gets his chance to prove himself. I mean, you know, he – he gets the chance to turn one game in a great moment into a full season. And like, if he's the real deal, like Mark Rogers will be ranking him number two, maybe even number one by the end of the uh, 2024 season. So like that's out there for Miller Moss to prove. And it's a, it's a prove it season. We we use that term all the time in sports. And so like the table is set and, uh, and hopefully Jaden Maiava is, is pushing Moss, uh, in this spring camp to the point that that Moss uh, is, you know, he, that he has just enough edge that like he doesn't feel entitled to this job. He feels that he's earning it every day, that his growth and evolution are constant so that when he gets onto the field at Allegiant Stadium in Las Vegas for that LSU opener, that uh, he'll have the right balance between expecting to be great, but also knowing that he has to put his stamp on this team in this season. Because as great as the Holiday Bowl was, and it was great, like that was a beautiful moment, and it was also a very hopeful moment for a USC team that needed some something good after that regular season and with Caleb Williams going off to the NFL draft. Like that was a really important moment, and it obviously changed Lincoln Riley's plans. It changed Will Howard's plans uh, as well. So we know how impactful that game was, and it was absolutely an absolutely awesome story. But now we go to the real, the real big boy table. That's LSU in week one. That's a Big Ten schedule. It's Notre Dame. I mean, if Miller Moss can put these teams at his feet, well, then he, he goes into the annals as one of the great Trojans of all time. Not so much like well, how does he compare to Marcus Allen or, or Charles White, but in terms of like a fabled college football player beloved by the fan base who waits his turn who shows immense loyalty and then when given the chance comes through that kind of college football story and that's what miller moss has a chance to create in 2024. here's my question 
Here's my question for, for both of you is, are you surprised that USC did not go to the portal that, uh, for, in, in any such way that they are banking on the, the one game? And of course, Lincoln Riley sees him in practice every day. So we have to trust his expertise in evaluating the, the play and the ability and not just one game. We know that he's going on far more than that. But I, I thought following the, the conclusion of the Pac-12 season, the regular season, that they were going to the transfer portal. And, of course, Will Howard was the guy that was reported uh, headed to Los Angeles at one point. Well, the question might be is when Will Howard watched that performance, you know, Will Howard mm. needs to get on the field. Do you think Will Howard wants to come somewhere and try to unseat somebody who's been in Lincoln Riley's offense, you know, for for this would be his third spring, so he'd have one to three, uh, and then compete for that job. I, I Will Howard I, is is a great quarterback, but how is how how is he going to be as efficient? We don't know. We, we never know what Will Howard would have been in this office, but we did see what Miller Moss can do. And the good thing about Miller Moss is, is he does not have to go in there and light the world on fire. The 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 quality receivers, the depth at receivers, the athleticism at receiver US he has in a Lincoln Riley system, you bring in you bring in Woody Marks. Um, you know, and you have Quentin Joyner coming along. I think with this young offensive line that's stepping up, uh, we saw what Elijah Page could do left field, uh, left left uh, tackle. You have Monheim going to move inside to center. Uh, I I think that you know the size alone of this offensive line getting bigger is going to be protective. I don't think that Miller Moss is going to have to do that much, and I think that Miller Moss is is the cerebral quarterback. But I mean, people keep throwing that on him. If you watch that game, the man he made some incredible throws with guys in his face. He was taking hits, getting rid of the ball. I, I just uh, think that people aren't giving Miller and Moss enough credit. Yes, it is only one game, but man, what a game he played. So that's, that's all I have to say. That was not, we were not playing Liberty, you know, USC played a pretty good Louisville defense and uh, Miller's play in that game was short of just spectacular. And I think that his play did scare away some quarterbacks i'm not saying that's what happened with will howard but it certainly could have helped the cause that's for sure and i don't think usc probably said well hold on do we really want to dump a bunch of nil into this guy when we got miller where we could spend that nil probably in a lot better places so i mean there's i don't want to take anything away from miller moss the guy speaks if you hear the guy talk you want to go to battle for this guy he he, he is truly a national born leader uh everyone speaks of him just being a brilliant brilliant mind so I, I know he's been sitting and soaking up that offense for a couple of springs, and he's got a third one under his belt. I'm not going to be surprised if he comes out against LSU and lights it up. And then they got a game against Utah State. It'll be a tune-up game for them heading over to Ann Arbor for the third game against Michigan. I, I honestly think that Miller and Moss has changed a lot of people's opinions. And you might, mid-season, Mark, have to re-rank him. Yeah, there will yeah be I'm no not surprised. Mid-season rankings. <laughs> Go ahead, Matt. Yeah, I'm not surprised, Mark, that USC did not go to the portal for a QB1. And, you know, people in the chat are saying, oh, he went to the portal for Mayaba. But that was not for a QB1. It was for a QB2. Uh, Lincoln Riley made it very clear, like we were going to get an older quarterback, you know, an upperclassman, someone who expects to be the guy who's not going to go through a quarterback battle in the spring or in August. You know, you get an older guy to be the QB1. So US, you know, USC did not go that route. So that's obviously what Mark was was referring to. I'm not surprised because I mean Tim kind of alluded to this, but let's just say like that Holiday Bowl was an audition. It's where are you at, Miller Moss? Can we trust you? This is the test. Like this is your graduate school exam, and he aced it. Like this, that was A plus. It was not B plus, B B minus. No, A plus. Like he he blew the doors off it. So that that's really why if it was moderately good, if, if USC scored, you know, 27 points, uh, if Moss threw only, you know, only <laughs> three touchdowns instead of six, you know, th then we have a different conversation. But like he was spectacular. He was so great. And uh, the key uh, decider or tiebreaker, if you will, is just that this is how the offense is supposed to look, not not in terms of uh, like, you know, you know, the way it, it looks for Caleb Williams will be different from the way it is for Miller Moss. But in terms of 
11 guys working together. Like Lincoln Riley's play design, the concepts, the things that he wanted to achieve on each play, they all just perfectly came to life from chalkboard onto the gridiron in reality. And so Miller Moss's ability to have 10 guys going to the limit, going to the wall for him, that again, that is something you cannot teach. You cannot coach that. People naturally gravitate to and respond to a leader. People naturally rally around a quarterback if he has that it factor, if he has that you know special sauce, that that unique blend of savory herbs and and leadership. Uh, you know, Miller Moss brings all of that to the table. He brings a unique recipe uh, to the football field. When you have that as a coach, you have to, if you're Lincoln Riley, you had to look at that holiday bowl and say, wow, I have 11 guys pulling together. I can't mess that up. I can't get in the way of that. Miller Moss is my incumbent now. He has the inside track. We do need a legitimate quality backup and, and younger so that there's upside for the future beyond. But, you know, so like backing up Miller Moss in case he gets hurt, but also he's there for 2025. Let's remember Oregon has that precise setup with Dylan Gabriel getting the keys for 2024, but you have Dante Moore waiting in the wings for 2025. USC has organized its quarterback room uh, the same way. But when you have to go back to why USC didn't get an older QB1, Miller Moss just has 10 guys who totally trust him and will execute plays for him, who will carry out their assignments for him. They will all work in tandem. You can't mess with that kind of chemistry as a coach when you get that in, in, in real life. And that is going to be what USC is going to count on. 11 guys working together in perfect harmony. Uh, we don't need to wonder if, if uh, Stevie Wonder and Paul McCartney uh, are going to be uh, singing uh, USC's fight song. But we do know everyone working in perfect harmony, uh, that's going to be what USC aims for. The cohesion, less than perhaps individual dynamism is going to be the the engine that powers USC this season. And and like that holiday bowl, that was not that wasn't just some fluke. I and mean, you're talking remember Miller was running with a lot of the twos, right? You you had Caleb running with the ones and a lot of those guys weren't there for that game. So it the the natural chemistry that he had with those receivers in that bowl game. The the way he got the ball out in rhythm on schedule the way he went through his progressions and checked out of it and threw the ball away, not putting those offensive linemen in a situation where they're going to have to hold a block too long, get a holding penalty, which derailed a lot of, of SC drives or, or hang on the ball and get a strip sack, et cetera. It all looked the way it did because Miller, again, is, is I think, going to flourish in the system with these receivers. And it was no surprise that that offensive line looked so well. A big part of that was the way Miller played the game. Yeah, that, that you know, Tim keeps making that point at, basically on every show here at the Voice of College Football, and it remains a great point every time he makes it that Miller Moss was working with the twos, and so he goes into the Holiday Bowl and he has that instant natural connection with Jacoby Lane with Makai Lemon. Can't overstate that enough. To have quarterbacks and receivers already on the same page again, you don't want to mess with that. You don't want to intervene into that and break it up if it's working so that uh, more reinforcement for why lincoln riley didn't get an older qb1 in the portal what are these folks talking about in the chat here let's see we've got about 320 on the line between all of our various uh outlets here i will ask you guys this so spring ball concludes on April 20th. Is that the spring game, I believe? So we're That's less right. than three yeah. weeks away. Correct. And then the portal opens. Well, so portal opens on April 16th. Oh, that's right. That's right. Yes, it does. Uh, so anyway, it will be yeah open roughly uh, close to a week prior to the spring game. So what's the priority list? Me? I'm Defense. going with... Defensive, defensive tackle, or offensive yeah. tackle. And yeah. I would say defensive yeah. tackle, number one, offensive tackle, number two. But, like, you, you won't find me complain if it's an offensive tackle, uh, not a defensive tackle. But, like, it's it's just the line play. you got to beef it up, and you got to have reinforcements uh, up front. Um, but, but, like, if, it's, if USC lands a premium offensive tackle for Miller Moss, 
hey, sign me up. But I would prefer defense if you if you said, well, you got to choose one. I would say defensive tackle first. Yeah, I'm, I'm with Matt. I've been saying tackles, like you just said, I'm either offensive or defensive tackle. You, you just need that depth on. I mean, you know, it's in the trenches. Guys go down all the time. Guys get banged up. It's gonna be a long season. This is look at the. Just think of the physicality. I mean, that's a big theme of their spring is physicality. That's what they're preaching on the defensive line, especially. There's going to be a, a lot of reps, a lot of banging, a lot of running. Granted, I think that's a cut down on the number of plays. However, I think that the type and style of play that they're about to get into, the meat grinder in the Big Ten, plus USC just decides, why not? We're USC, so we'll play LSU and Notre Dame for our, non our non-conference schedule. Uh, it's just going to be a, a, a season. Football is a game of attrition. I want to nickel for everything I've said that as well in these shows. And you just always see it in November. You, you just see the teams that do really well late in the season, the ones that have two, three deep. You know, there's no surprise that Georgia and Ohio State and Alabama and LSU and these teams really don't have a lot of trouble late in the season. We've seen USC fade in seasons. Why is that? Because they don't have the depth, especially on the lines. And that's what you've seen from USC start out hot, playing well. It's not just a level of competition. Look at how look at that uh, championship game against Utah two years ago, when you have you know Andrew, Andrew Voorhees didn't even play in that game, didn't even suit up. Why? Because he was banged up. Uh, you know, uh, you need to have depth on both lines and tackle, 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 offense or defenses. Give them to me. Also, I believe USC has seven scholarship wide receivers. They could probably use a you know a nice top flight veteran wide receiver. If they could pull in rent, a, rent a receiver for a year, um, that would also be something that'd be useful. I remember that championship game because I do not like to miss predictions. And in the first half, I was thinking, boy, I, I called this one wrong. But, well, no, uh, hold on though. Remember this things turned around. They, USC yes, was still Caleb in that Williams game. Was hurt. He was, he was still in USC was still in that game into the fourth quarter. That was out. Like I said, we didn't play with Nilon. I was, sorry, we didn't play with, um, Voorhees, right, our All-American left guard for the entire game. Then you lose um, Nilon, our center, in that game, the fourth quarter. SC was marching to make it a three-point game. We lost, we lost Nilon on that drive, and then, then that was it. Um, USC. If Ka and, oh, by, oh, by the way, this guy Caleb Williams. You might have heard him, the Heisman Trophy winner. He, 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 he screwed up his hamstring and like the the first series or second series of the yeah. game. USC, it was, oh, no, it was like third, because USC had, like, they were going for the, they ended up selling for a field goal and, and have 17 points. So USC was rolling. That that uh, Utah defense had no way to stop that offense. No no way. You, it's hard. They beat USC in Salt Lake City, right, the, earlier in the year. But this is on a neutral field, Allegiant Field, and USC's offense was doing whatever they wanted in that first quarter. And until... I mean, Caleb, remember the play he got hurt on? It was like a 50-yard scramble. They were going in to go up 21 points, but he got hurt. That has a way of changing a game. But the – okay. But the original no, point no, was that – You, can, you can laugh all you want. Losing Miller Moss – I mean, lose, sorry, losing Caleb Williams that game was the reason why they lost that game. Well, well, there's no doubt about maybe. it. Maybe. But, I mean we'll – But, I mean, but, but you know, there was, a, there, there was we'll a separate – there was a separate side of the ball. And of course, to get back to what we were talking about in terms of USC's portal needs, you know, against Utah, we saw Eric Gentry getting ragdolled, you know, getting thrown around by Utah's physicality, superior uh, power. And he wasn't that healthy just, either. He wasn't well, healthy either. He was coming off an injury. Sure. sure. But but it remains that USC's defense was soft. You know, it was Charmin soft. That was the Alex Grinch experience. Uh, and so, you know, that that dominated the second half of that game. So in terms of what USC needs in the portal, it's not only getting those big beefy guys up front. That's one thing. But the other thing is who's coaching those big guys now? Coach Henny. Woof, woof. Dog work. You know, you're you're getting you're going to get better player development up front on the defensive line with Coach Henny there. So, and you know, if, if 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 there were Go ahead, Tim. Oh, and, and Matt Enns. So let's not forget about that. We just talked about linebacker, sure. linebacker play. Sure. You got Matt yeah. Enns coming as well. Yeah. Yes. So, like, the, the uh, this is a theme I keep hitting on, that the value of a defensive recruit, there's inherent value, you know, just getting that player in and of itself. But then you have the added value of 
he's going to be getting so much better coaching uh, on the defensive side of the ball than, than what we've seen uh, the past two seasons. So there's inherent value, but then there's added value uh, from this defensive staff. And that's also why I would lean toward, you know, more defensive uh, reinforcements because because every third down stop this defense is able to get in 2024, you know, that just reduces the burden on Miller Moss. Uh, and this offense to have to score 40 points, you know, which was, of course, the Caleb Williams uh, experience. Anything, it, it, if the defense can keep taking forward steps uh, in its evolution, you know, that that every step forward the defense makes means it reinforces the idea, Miller Moss, you do not have to be a hero. You can just work within the offense. You do the things that Tim's been talking about, and everything can come together as a cohesive whole, 22 guys uh, you know, all, all flowing in this and rowing in the same uh, direction. So again, for the portal, give me defensive linemen, give me defensive tackles. Uh, first, if, if that is, you know, if you ask me about one position group, that would be it. But again, you're not going to find me complaining about an elite offensive tackle. Not at all. I'm, I'm some interesting conversations. I, I'm even on the outside. I mean, I would like that veteran part. That's the key word there. Veteran. I do like, I think Tobias Raymond, yeah, he put he put that weight on. He came in a bit thin, and he did an interview recently. He was talking about after practice that you know he's just and, and Riley was talking about it as well. He's getting used to that weight. He put on like forty. He was I think he was playing at two sixty in high school. Now he's up to over north of three hundred pounds, well over three hundred pounds. And you know it does take a little bit of time to play with all that. You know to get used to playing with all that weight, getting that quickness, getting your step, not being opening up too much keeping your bend. And I think that he's going to do that. These guys, he had that frame coming in. I remember it was Rick and I talking about it when, when he came in, we were saying that that's the kind of guy, you know, that USC gets and turns it out of nowhere. The guy's like a tight end frame body, but then they, they, you bulk him up. He's got all that left uh, athleticism. You know, he's got good feet. If he can put that size on and play with that size, he's got the makings of an NFL uh, uh, tackle. Now, obviously he's, it's a long way between this and that, but that's where Henson's going to make his money. And so I, I do would like to see where else to go, but I'm, I'm with you. The crew, I know we have the guys on the roster. My say, my point is, is early on, we have tests against LSU and against Michigan, and we can find ourselves out of this race for anything really, really nice very early. That's why having maybe a veteran tackle uh, would be a nice luxury to have. Like a, again, like a Bobby Haskins who came in and was phenomenal in 22. The end of uh, basketball season means I get to sit down with Matt on a regular basis and churn out some tremendous college football conversations centering on USC, first and foremost, centering on USC's transition to the Big Ten, and of course, the ever-changing college football landscape and how that pertains to USC football. So be looking out for those bonus uh, segments. And of course you can get those. There's already 14 available for you as a YouTube channel member right here, the voice of college football SC. This was again, great support of the show. Roy Abanuelos, father of Micah Abanuelos. Thank you for being here. He's saying, believe me, if he's saying that the O-line needs to take another jump, I'm going to take his word on that. The O-line is going to need to take another jump. Um, I, I think that, this season will be dependent on that offensive line. I do think the defense will be solid. I, and I think that, that we talked about Miller Moss and we talked about that with wide receivers. And we talked about Woody and Quinton, but if it all starts up front, you know, can, and, and they talked about, you know, Henson talked about us and, and Riley talked about it. The fact that you need to have, um, we know that Elijah page, he's young as well on the outside, but is Jonah Monheim going to be able, you know, we're, we're baking on him at center. You know, is he to come along uh, at center? You know, we really don't know that. Jason Zandamel is a freshman. You know, he's gonna he's gonna take some time, right? You know, we have we have Micah Banuelos, but he's been dinged up. Uh, are we going to be able to solidify that center position? That you know, the communication on that line last year was, I think, a big part of it. There was a lot a lot of uh, miscommunication, which left a lot of broken. Uh, you, you saw a lot of guys coming free at Caleb. So I think that USC needs to make sure that they sure up that offensive line. And I think they will. I really honestly do. I, the, the size and, and these guys, I think Amos Talele is going to be amazing. You know, you got, we also have to remember 
that um, uh, Gino Quinones is coming back from injury this year. If he can come back strong and, and healthy, that would be a huge boost to the team. And I already talked about uh, Tobias Raymond. So um, I, I am excited about it. But uh, I think I think Roy's right. They're going to have to take that jump if USC is going to be successful. In, and I wrote about that, Matt. I said, what up? If they were talking about you got to win nine seasons. I said, no, forget forget wins and losses. You look at look at 2001, right? Go back to that year where there was it was a six and six season. You know, it, this, the record didn't mean crap. We saw, especially at the end of the year, that shut out of UCLA. We saw where Pete took that team in the beginning of the year. And then by the end of the year, you knew that 2002 and that Orange Bowl year was coming around the way. Why? Because you saw an absolute shift in the way these guys were hitting, in the way these guys were playing as a team. And that's what I want to see. For this to be a successful season, we don't need to win 10, 9 games. That would be great. I want to see what we're hearing about with this defense. I want to see what we're hearing about this offense. And I think if we do hear that, 9, 10 wins should be absolute the, the, probably the floor for this team. So let's... uh Let's worry about the wins less than let's worry about this defense, this 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 scheme with Lynn and these these amazing coaches coming together and putting together that clear and definable difference that we saw from last year. Then will be then it will be a successful season. And I and I would I would say and you know I think you know Tim's fundamentally right. Let's walk away from this 2024 season knowing that everything's been moved forward substantially so that then you're going to get into basically the Lincoln Riley equivalent of, as Tim was alluding to, that Pete Carroll sweet spot, 2002 through 2008, that you're setting the table for a really good run. That this year, you know, last year was a waste of time. It was a total failure. So this year could be like a transition year. Could be. Uh, I'm I'm kind of I'm kind of hedging. I realize that, but like let's make sure that we end 2024 knowing, not hoping knowing that in 2025 this program will be will be ready to rock and roll i would agree with that and i think that the other point to make on top of what tim has already said is simply that you know if us when usc plays lsu if it's a classic game you know if it's an epic battle and both teams are throwing haymakers left and right and it's the kind of game that you just you're talking about for a long time and usc loses well okay we, we lost a great game tip of the cap to lsu you played wonderfully and um, we just didn't get the result, you know, that's one scenario. If it's a, if it's a blunder bowl, like, you know, Super Bowl five, uh, you know, something like that, and, and USC gives the game away, well, then, then you're just absolutely hating life. Uh, so in many ways, it is about, you know, the quality of play. If, if opponents bring their very best against USC, you know, in sports, you can play great and lose. That's part of the, the magnificence of sports competition, that you can be absolutely awesome, but if your opponent's even better, you can lose. And then the flip side is you could play like dog doo-doo, but yet if the other team's worse, you win. And so, you know, so it, it, process and results, having the right marriage, you know, making sure that if you do lose, it's because your opponent uh, just absolutely, uh, you know, play, played perfectly or close to it. And if you win, it's because you played well, not because the other game, uh, st the other team stepped on a rake. So we're going to go through that balance of process and results with USC uh, in 2024. That's for sure. Coming off of Matt's reference to Super Bowl five, I would love to quiz the chat on who Chuck Howley is. But that said, I believe LSU and uh, USC. I I just am fascinated to see that game. I believe that's going to be the game of the weekend that would be the one game that i would watch above any other game i've looked at the schedule for that weekend and i'm the guy that wants to see 25 games so that's difficult for me to do typically to choose one but that would be the one because it is a flip of the coin in my eyes at this point at least absolutely and the thing to i mean we're going to be talking of course a lot about this game over the summer and obviously through august but just to kind of set the table now. And if people have religiously watched this show without fail, you know that I've said this, but I'll say it again, you know, as we, you know, develop that on-ramp toward August and then uh, Labor Day weekend. And that is that USC fans want to run the ball, run the ball, run the ball. And like on a broader level, yes, that absolutely has to happen. You need to be more physical. It can no longer be soft. 
Last year was a soft team, so there is the need to be tougher, uh, and, you know, more brawn, more muscle, a little bit less cleverness and finesse. But, but you also have to win your game on a given day against a given opponent. You need to play to the matchup. You need to expose the other team's weakest point, and LSU's weakest point is its secondary. So I was as much as you Kelly. Have, right now, I'm sorry. <laughs> As much as, <laughs> as much as USC fans want to run the ball, the LSU matchup might mean that the Trojans will need to throw the ball, you know, and, and, and have an imbalanced uh, run-pass uh, mixture. So just like I want the fan base to be prepared for that, that the LSU matchup might dictate throwing, that and people might lose their, lose their lunch over that, uh, but the, you need to be ready for that possibility. And so, like, that is just something to keep in mind about the LSU game in particular. Folks, we so much appreciate you being here at the Voice of College Football. And as it says on the screen, it is easy to just hit that like button. And, of course, subscribe. It is free. And you can catch that subscribe button right in the corner. At it, Tim is pointing out to us with a big white arrow. Please subscribe uh right here usc the voice of college football and if you're out there on the different platforms you know go ahead and i i know that you threw stream or you can leave us a message i'd love to hear from you guys out there on twitter uh also on instagram if you guys want to drop a follow to the voice of college football or myself that we're, we're streaming on both of those as well um and I, we're, we're thinking about going out to uh facebook as well because there are a number of people from facebook groups that have expressed interest so if you are one of them, let us know. We uh, we are looking to expand and get as many followers as we can going into the season. Got got duck in one note uh, before we close up shop, and that is you know, some people in the chat were asking what what's the uh, television for the uh, spring game on Saturday, April twenty. Well, I can tell you this: I don't I don't know specifically which outlet is doing this, but I know it will not be Pac twelve Network. Really. <laughs> That's done. That's done. That's in the past. So I would expect either big. I would. I would expect Big Ten Network to probably be uh, the outlet. Um, it could be ESPN, but I would be betting on Big Ten Network as the likely outlet for that game. But it's not going to be Pac-12 Network. You're out of here. See ya. Thank God. Thank God for that. I am right there with Matt. I would think that the Big Ten Network would be salivating to get yes. that game. Absolutely. Gotta get that one. You would think. You would think. Yes, there are a ton of games. Uh, really, the 13th and the 20th are the, the big weekends for the spring games. And as of right now, uh, the FBS schedules... Yeah, it is not showing us anything in regards to a TV network at this point. Man, I'm, I'm glad you said that, Matt, because I thought for sure that it was on the the Pac-12 network. But that's 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 amazing. Now, all the all you guys with YouTube TV, right? Uh, you're gonna be able to get that Big Ten network and be able to watch on YouTube TV. So that's gonna be. If it is in new. fact on the Pac-12 network, because the Cal game is on the Pac-12 network. They're leaving for another conference, of course, as well. Again, I thought it was. So I thought it was. Is this being considered a spring sport? It's in the spring semester, and the Pac-12 is still. And I don't think we go over until till into June, right? Is when the official because you have all the baseball and all the spring sports going on. So, Matt, you wait, Matt. Did you just tell me that? Did you just tell me a fib? Because I got all excited about the, not having uh, to do it. I certainly, I'm, I'm firmly up. I, like I don't know this for a fact. I haven't seen a TV listing. Look at like, this. This has to be in the past. Colorado is on the Pac-12 network. Yeah, chat makes, I'm gonna check makes the chat. sense to me. Arizona is on the Pac-12 network. Wow. Yeah, I think we're going to be stuck. I I, I, I kind of swore I remember hearing that the game would be on the Pac-12 network. You heard that it would be on? I, I, well, I mean, nothing official. That's, nothing really official. that's one more episode of stupidity before the way out, going out the door. Good Lord. Like, that, that is just the dumbest thing. Like, everyone's excited for the Big Ten. Yeah, we just got to get Yogi Roth over we to the Big played Ten. Our last big, we've played our last Pac-12 football game. But 
But but hey, you know, college sports, right? Well, that, that is just the dumbest thing. That means unless I, I make a move and get the Pac-12 network, I'm going to be relegated. I'm either going to be watching, well, probably at the same time, the Illinois spring game on the Big Ten network and the Wake Forest spring game on the ACC network. That's what I'll be <laughs> taking in. That's painful, Mark. Just the it's... dumbest possible stuff. Jesus. We are the voice of college football, Tim. So we track everyone. Yeah. You, you, you sure you should go the distance watching that kind of a game because I that's you know that goes into what we were talking about um a couple of weeks ago about you're gonna have some so so here's the thing there might be Oregon State but they were our Oregon State and Oregon State had beaten USC and matter of fact in in spectacular fashion to knock us out they may have been Washington State but they also during those Pete Carroll years rose up and took care of us and going to Martin stadiums was never an easy thing to do, but they were our Washington state. I'm wondering how USC fans are going to take Purdue and Indiana and, and games like that. Are they going to be able to get up for those? I know they'll get up for, you know, obviously you're going to get up for Michigan this year and Wisconsin and Penn state, you know, and, and then in the future, Ohio state. Uh, but are the, are these new rivalries, how long will they take? to set you know how many people are, i mean i know people will go out to maryland just for the trip but i mean will there be that maryland rivalry that we've had i'm wondering what it's gonna be like for the fan base yes it's gonna be new yes some of these programs are you know we played them a bunch of times in rose bowls but there's some of these these games the matchups that may not be as attractive to usc fans whereas you would see fans excited about playing arizona jed fish in a hot offense be interesting to see what the numbers are like so the games in particular for 2024 at Minnesota, at Maryland, yeah. Rutgers at home. Those would be the three. Nebraska, you would think, just based on name brand. Yeah, Nebraska and Nebraska and Michigan and Penn State and Wisconsin. Yeah, those those will have eyeballs. The the ones you just named, the Minnesotas, yes. you know, on the road to Minnesota, on the road to to Maryland. Even, even though if people are just concerned about the football and not the name on the jersey, Nebraska's, they're Rutgers, Minnesota, until proven otherwise. But we know what, get, what garners eyeballs is the name on the jersey a lot of time, not necessarily how good that team is. Absolutely. Folks, appreciate you being here. Trojan Conquest Live. Again, it's going to be every Monday once we clear basketball season. In the meantime, Matt and Tim on Trojan's Wire. Matt, anything you want to highlight there? No, just, uh, you know, Tim's providing his coverage uh, of uh, football and uh, doing as only he can. And like, hey, today, though, I mean, we've had everything. We've had, uh, you know, a recruit, recruiting commitment. We've had, uh, you know, Eric Musselman apparently going to interview for the men's basketball job tomorrow. There's been a rumor that Bronny James hit the portal. That's not been confirmed. So, like, it doesn't seem to have happened. But, like, that's been hot on uh, social media the past four hours. Like, just everything is happening. Uh, I would say that because the USC women didn't make the uh, uh, women's final four, that national semifinal is on a Friday. So because the women lost, I will be able to join Tim for the Friday show uh, this coming Friday. Yes, make sure you guys are tuning in for that. If you, so if you guys are catching us for the first time on uh, Twitter or on Instagram, uh, a lot of you guys here, maybe even here on YouTube, we do a live uh, call-in show with a traditional phone line. You guys call in and you tell us. We'll throw some stuff out there for you guys to talk about. But it's complete. It's your show. You guys are the stars of the show. Uh, we usually have at least a dozen or so calls. We'll try to speed those up a little bit, but it's just a great uh, time to sit and talk SC football. So join us for the Conquest Call-In Show. Uh, it'll be Friday at 6 p.m. Uh, phone line, again, is simple as could be, 888-99-RILEY. Uh, you can't mess that one up. Uh, we are accepting calls from all fan bases, not just USC. Once in a while, we'll get an Oklahoma call. Those are always entertaining, you know, uh, but we're, we're here uh, – we're a show of the people, and if you want to come in and, and give your reverence to USC or if you want to take some shots, call on in. We'd love to hear from you. These two are amazing. I am happy to be along for the ride here every Monday night. Uh, Matt, thank you so much for all that you do for us. 
Tim, you as well, of course. And we'll see everybody back here on the next edition of Trojan Conquest Live. Of course, subscribe. Notification needs to be on to know when we go live to oh. work around the men's basketball championship game. That's what I was gonna say. Make sure this is this is going forward. But you know, remember, uh, we won't be we will not be doing it uh, on next Monday. It'll be Thursday. It'll probably be Tuesday again, right, you guys? So to make room for that for that championship game. See you next time.